Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? I'm good, Jason. I think I have um, I may have solved a, a minor mystery. Um, a little person's mystery? No. 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 A small mystery. Oh, a small mystery. Okay, yeah. yeah. thanks. Um, so you know how I um, consistently misname the people in our office, like I'll call Josh, Luke, and vice versa? Yeah, they all have four-letter names. It's they really, do. Yeah. They do, but I'm generally terrible with names, right? Mm. It takes me ages to remember people's names. Yeah. Um, so I was in my car and I got a kick of nostalgia um, and I realised that what the problem must be is that my brain is actually full of lyrics from songs from the 90s that I haven't heard in two decades, but once they start playing, I can still actually be word perfect singing along to, which is just absurd. Songs that I literally yeah. forgot existed. Once they start playing, I can just sing them with like 98% accuracy. So yeah, that's just a terrible use of the, <laughs> the available storage in my brain. Yeah, um, I don't know that there's much that I can do about it though. Yeah, I don't know a way of cleaning out memories that is just taking up too much space. Yeah. There was an episode on Brooklyn Nine-Nine where they, this actually happened. Um, yes, where the chief, uh, yeah, was getting married and, uh, yeah, he wiped out a bunch of stuff that he had in his brain that had no relevance. It's in the final season sometime. You okay. know, any, any Brooklyn Nine-Nine watchers out there, they'll, they'll maybe know the references. Right, okay. <laughs> it's very I've, niche. I've maybe not, uh, not seen that one yet. But, yes, but, yeah. Um, yeah, he's able to do it. Uh, I don't think it's a skill that many people have, though. But no. it might explain why, um, yeah, Peter calls you Jolie all the time um, because he's got that as a music. That's Jolene. Jolene. But he calls you Jolie. I know. But it's like kind of like, I think he kind of mixes together Jolene and Joelle no, and comes think, up with Jolie. I, I think that it's because when people see my name written down, they recognise the Joel part of it and then they add the l at the end of it. Yeah, okay. I think that's how it, that's. I think it's anchored in the Joel part of the Joel. Mm. Yeah. I haven't had anyone mispronounce my name before. Shocking. I know. Yeah. It's good. It'd be really Any, Look, anybody who's from France or Belgium has no trouble pronouncing my name. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you need to relocate. We, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. Well, Alicia's already put her hand up to go to France. So. I think that's just for a visit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that she'd want to move there. Yeah. Oh, well. Hey, look. We've got a really cool guest yes. on today. We should probably introduce her in. Um, she's actually the first guest we've had returned back for a one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a year's worth of podcast tour. Yes. Last time she joined us as president-elect of IOSH. That's the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. This time she joins us as president of IOSH. Welcome to the podcast, Louise Hosking. Hi. I didn't know I was the first person to come back twice. I feel deeply honoured. Thank you for having me. Well, so you should be. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we've had uh, people return on uh, as panellists and Peter Kelly likes to make surprise guest appearances. He does just sort of pop up <laughs> every now and then. definitely half expecting him to pop in today. <laughs> yeah, he, he does call up and he's like, Jace, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm about to record a podcast. Oh, I'll jump in. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it's hard to say no to Pete. Brilliant. But um, yeah, really great to have you on again, Louise. And uh, yeah, it's uh, International Women's Day, the day that this podcast will be released. So great to have someone um, who is a female representing uh, the health and safety industry. Yeah, no, great. Um, I mean, I'm so I'm the 55th president of IOSH in its 76 year history, and I'm the seventh woman. So I'm hoping that just me being here and demonstrating to everybody you know if I can do it um anybody can do it and just you know strive strive for your dreams I guess so yeah I'm really hoping that it will it will be a boost to women in our industry to sort of step forward and step up yeah and, and look another influence part of you thanks Jason <laughs> so um look Please tell us what you've been up to since. Uh... Yeah, well, so um, it's been 
completely full on. So um, one of my colleagues that I work with actually said to me, becoming president is like drinking from a fire hose. And I think that's a really good analogy. Um, but yeah, I took over the presidency in November um, and I have some key themes. So my theme is people, sustainability and putting heart into health and safety. So it's all about people first. Um, and caring about how people feel. So psychological health and safety is really important, an important part of my themes, um, because as you guys know, um, if we have strong psychological health and safety within our organisations, we build trust. Um, and I think that we're seeing that coming through now and organisations realise and understand that it's a core component for success within their organizations. If they've got psychological health and safety as a strong foundation, um, you've got people gonna bring their best selves to work, aren't they? And they're gonna, um, yeah, they're gonna push forward. And I think um, for me, having that theme was important because um, we talk about, you know, we've, we've, in some areas we see health and safety is quite process driven. Um, but actually at the heart of it is people and if we can care about how people feel then we can protect their physical health and safety and their psychological health and safety so um, yeah that's been a really core theme to my presidency um, I've also been talking about modern leadership skills um, so looking at how we can empower people, looking at the language that we use as well. So being forward driven and proactive um, is, is all part of that. And of course, um, EDI has always been a strong theme of mine. So um, really pushing women through within our industry. Um, and and I've, what I've found is a lot of the women that are coming through and not taking those steps forward because um, Anna Keen, who you probably know, I don't know, um, talks about sticky floors. So we hold ourselves back um, and we think, you know, I can't do this, so I'm not going to do it. Um, so it's working with um, women and showing, showing them that they can do it and just boosting that confidence to take those next step forwards. Um, but a really interesting part of my presidency as well is that as well as being president, I'm chair of IOSH Council. So IOSH Council is the elected body. So we've members elect um, council members and mem those council members represent um, members and we provide advice and guidance to the board. So that's certainly been keeping me busy as well. So, yeah. It's, it's been pretty full on. So I've been doing lots of writing, um, podcasts, um, yeah, full on. And what's been the reception from the industry for, for those themes that you're talking about? It's, it's interesting. Um, I think generally, I, when I started talking about putting the heart into health and safety, I wasn't quite sure how that was going to be received because it makes it all a bit more touchy-feely doesn't it um and I've been very pleasantly surprised in that people have really taken to that um and I haven't really had any negative comments regarding it I think there is a culture you know there is always going to be that clash of um you know more traditional styles of command control um are used to sort of right you know this is what the rules say this is what the legislation says this is what we've got to get done whereas you know what we're saying and moving forward in terms of our sector and our industry is that we've actually to take our people with us in this world that's ever changing um, we've got to care about how they feel and we've got to involve them in the decisions that we're making um, and that that can be that's a tough transition um, in many ways. But it, I can I can see the trains going now and, you know, we've got momentum for this. And I think it's definitely going to bring a much more modern approach to health and safety. And so what sorts of um, resources has IOSH been developing to 
help support this transition? So um, you may be aware of the Catch the Wave campaign, which is fantastic. Um, and we've got some really great resources on the website in respect of that. And this is all to do with sustainability. So talking about sustainability in its broadest sense, um, and I, I always think that businesses talk about being sustainable. I mean, you, you guys run a small business and you know what that takes. You've got to think about the future. How are you going to keep things running? So in business, we talk about sustainability, but outside of business, we tend to use the word sustainability and think the environment and climate change. Um, so it's it's considering sustainability in its in its broadest sense and saying, you know, health and safety is part of this. And we need to have social sustainability balanced against the environment and our financial um, interests within our organisations to be truly sustainable. So again, it's kind of this forward looking um, route to health and safety and, and saying, you know, we've got to care for our people, we've got to care for our supply chains, um, because we have a global skills shortage. Um, and they're choosing where they're going to go. And are you going to go somewhere where, you know, you, you feel part of the organisation that you're working alongside? Do you feel psychologically health, healthy? You feel physically safe? Um, um, and people are choosing where they're going. And I think we're, we're seeing a change. And I mean, that's come out of the other side of the pandemic, hasn't it? Yeah, very much so. And I think... Um across all sorts of, of industries as well, you know, um, knowledge workers as well as, you know, people working in hospitality and really that that sort of full gamut of um, of different, yeah, professionals and, and industries, which is quite interesting um, to see that, that sort of a trend so globally like that. Yeah, and I, I think that, in this, you know, we know that those industries and those sectors that are, you know concentrated on the health of their workers during the pandemic they're coming through the other side um, and I think it's going all the way through up to the big financiers are, are really looking at this now and it's it's no good anymore to say health and safety is our number one priority it's it's everybody's it, it's about walking the talk now and um, health and safety professionals have a really key part to play in all of that so that they're providing you know current information to boards um, that they can use to push their organizations forward so so catch the wave is is a hugely exciting campaign um, and we've got white papers we've got resources on the website and it's about articulating our messages around health and safety to be much more forward-looking. Yeah, that sustainability angle is, is so important. I mean, we've had a live panel um, focusing on, on social impact and uh, the health and safety profession obviously plugs in very nicely into the S in, in ESG. Um, and even just um, the last month, I guess, in locally here in Australia, it's become almost visceral how much interest there is in this. How can we show that we're looking after our people? Uh, we did a, have a big miner in the last month here in the West um, who came forward with a report that they made public about sexual harassment and racism and, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really great that they're owning the, the problem and now they're, you know, uh, are forced to come up with a solution because that will be very public as well. What do they do with this information? But what we found, it's actually shaken up the whole industry and gone, well, this is a massive reputational risk. Our shareholders will hold us to account. Um, this will affect how our company is perceived in the market and how it's valued ultimately, um, we need to deal with this. And it's actually become a priority for a lot of companies, not just in mining, but you know, across the board. They're going, wow, what we thought was a risk and what we had Dr. Beck McCulloch talk about a year ago um, regarding reputational risks associated with sexual harassment, um, all of a sudden, bang, it's just become so visceral. Mm. Mm. It's, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, Wade Needham, who's been on a few times on panels and whatnot, he was on that social impact panel as well. You know, he works at the nexus of uh, OHS and ESG. And, um, you know, he definitely, you know, is working with the profession to go, well, you know, at a board level, this is where the health and safety can have more of more impact 
if you're like you say catching the wave and you know um, showing how you can create value in that very important space that's important for leadership teams yeah I, I saw that report and um the recommendations that have have come out of it is all about creating um gender balance so one of the things they're going to look at is you know we've ha- we've had this horrific report that's you know and it was horrific um you know and how are we going to address it and one of the ways that they were looking to address it was to create greater gender balance um and bring in more underrepresented groups um and and there's some you know it, it is it there's some interesting sort of science behind um how women coming into the industry can look at this through a very different lens and a different perspective um and I think where you've got very male dominated um, sectors like mining, um, like construction, I think these things can start to eat away at an organisation um, because there's nobody there to say, actually, this isn't acceptable and, and we need to stop. Um, so so actually creating that balance is, is a really interesting one. I mean, I, I remember early on in my career, actually, um, when I was working with an organisation, I arrived there and, you know, some of the basic health and safety needs that women have, you know, just, um, you know, coming into pregnancy or coming out of pregnancy, they just didn't exist. Um, and it kind of takes a female, sometimes it takes a female health and safety professional to actually say, you um, this isn't acceptable the way that you know we're treating each other um isn't acceptable and and it is it's an interesting dynamic i think yeah i I think look it's very topical given today is you know the day that this podcast will come out is international Mm -hmm. women's day to talk about how to create more gender balance and you know we talked about how mining and construction is more male dominated um the health and safety profession is also more male dominated as you pointed to uh what most of the presidents, uh, all but seven of the presidents of IOSH in the Number last fifty five yeah. years, yeah, have uh, have been men. Um, so, um, with that in mind, um, do you feel that the gender balance in the health and safety profession is changing? I, th- I think it has, I, I'm, I'm, and it is. Um, so we know that we've got around in IOSH, we've got around twenty one thousand, um, twenty one percent of members are female so and 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 I've always said it's kind of got stuck on that statistic I've been a member of IOSH since 1999 and it's definitely got a bit stuck on that statistic um but I think you've got to look at where health and safety came from so traditionally it came from factories construction mining that kind of thing so we were always going to have it was always going to be quite male dominated but I think um health and safety is evolving and you know transforming and it's it's becoming much more intertwined within our organizations and so the the broad range of skills that we need and certainly the psychological health and safety um is definitely bringing more women into the industry um so i think we are seeing that rise um and one of the i was giving some stats the other day is we've we've had more female um fellows of iosh in the last year to 18 months than we've ever had so i think you know it's just having successful health and safety professionals who are women standing up and saying, you know, you can do this, um, makes all of the difference, definitely. Um, and interesting, I'm going to just give another plug for something, actually, Jason. Oh, is, plug away, um, Louise. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm also involved with One Wish, which stands for Women and Inclusion in Safety and Health. So we're... Um, it's a not-for-profit organisation that's supporting um, women and underrepresented groups to come into the health and safety industry and feel supported. And um, I actually pre-recorded it this week um, before I got this cold <clears throat> and um, with um, five other presidents. So that is one not to be missed. So um, we've got the president of CSSE, ASSP, myself, 
um, IRSM and the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. And we had the most amazing conversation. So, you know, if that doesn't spur women in health and safety to um, reach their ambitions and go beyond, um, I think that will be a really good one to watch out for. And it's it's going to be on the One Wish um, platform on the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day. Yeah, so the same day that this podcast comes out. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah if I'm you're listening to this podcast, Jason. this will be about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you said um, in there, though, right, um, the interesting thing. So in the last 20 years, it seems to be that the membership base of IOSH has been stuck around about that 21% mark. Um, great to hear that there's more fellows um, that mm-hmm. are joining the ranks of or IOSH at that level that are female. Mm-hmm. Um, but what do you think would change that or increase the rate of change where we have more women um, who are being represented in the health and safety profession? I, I, I think the main piece and what I'm, I'm, you know, fighting for, if you like, is um, pushing women into, or not pushing, but encouraging them into leadership roles. Um, so we still don't have that many women in leadership roles within health and safety. And I think we need to get women into those leadership roles. Um, one of the pieces that I'm working on within IOSH, so I have a governance, I'm part of the governance structure of IOSH, um, as well as being the president, which is outward facing. Um, and one of the areas that I've been working on in respect of that is to encourage women to become part of council, um, to become part of the board of trustees as well. So if we can actually get women into um, the those positions I think it will start to change the narrative and will create that balance um which which will create the change that we want to see so I think there's a lot of things I mean I I I also talk a lot about part-time work shouldn't be part of a career either um and I think we need to move away from feeling like if somebody's working part-time um they're not doing a whole job um, because we know that, you know, more women have got caring responsibilities, but actually wouldn't it be amazing over the next 10 years or so, if we see that balance on, on, you know, from both genders. So, you know, we know that men want to spend more time with their children as well. So if we can create that gender balance at home, I think it will translate into work and we'll start to see, um a greater balance in all that we're doing yeah it was um atlassian i think saw um the other day that came out with some really forward thinking um maternity provisions um where i think they got full uh, maternity rights or leave rights um before you know it's at the time of employment they didn't have to accrue that or build mm. that up um and you know that's you know in this world where you know it's kind of a battle for talent you know, mm. to be able to demonstrate that at the point of recruitment, to have those sort of policies in place. And it was a, um, it was for both parties as well, wasn't it? So that um, whether you were a birth, like a yeah. gestating parent, <laughs> <laughs> that's the right word for yeah. it. Um, or, I you love know, that so, word. <laughs> um, yeah, r- regardless of what your, your function was in the pregnancy, you were still entitled to that same period of leave as well, I think. Yeah. Was, was, or maybe that was a different company. I remember seeing that there were some companies um, introducing those types of policies as well. So, you know, where you traditionally um, your paternity leave is maybe three weeks, um, which, you know, anyone who's had a baby will agree is an absurd um, amount of time mm. um, that it, it was actually sort of equal to the the maternity provisions that, that they were offering as well. So there's, yeah, I think, yeah, we can talk, you know, lots of talk about things like glass ceilings and, you know, the importance of representation for women to actually be willing to step forward and, you know, be able to see themselves um, in those roles and and see that there's opportunity and, um, you know, that they can actually perform those roles. But, yeah, there's also the, you know, we need to have the mechanisms and the permissions for men to also then step in to, to do those um, caring roles and, and all of that sort of thing that women do typically take on 
um, so that there's both room for women in the organisations to do those things, but also that they've got the um, the capacity within themselves to take on that extra um, work in um, in their employment as well. Yeah, and I think um, we, the, so. The president's panel we we had this week has been fascinating, and this was definitely a topic that came up came through around you know caring responsibilities and you know you strive to do these things and and it's not easy being in these leadership roles and you kind of find yourself thinking you know something it's like I'm I'm, I'm not being a good wife I'm not being a good mom I'm not you know a, am I good enough I think and I and I think women feel that a lot when they come into these kind of positions um and I th- you know Ruth Denyer in particular talk, spoke about that really eloquently um, and, and that feeling of well actually if I take this position am I going to be good enough and and so that's where the whole sticky floor thing comes comes from is we're not pushing ourselves forward um, and, and I think you know health and safety can depending on the environment that you're working in it can become quite adversarial um you know you're quite often a team of one um and 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 you know there's a lot to take on there I think you know I don't know if you've done any podcasts around the psychological health and safety of health and safety professionals I don't think we have I don't that's no. a, that's a yeah. good idea it's a great it's a great topic <laughs> yeah because <laughs> we've talked about you know for certain uh, people who are tasked with different things. So mental health first aiders, for example, mm. talking about the hazards associated with that. Um, yeah, but, but first responders, um, The nurses. caregivers, yeah, nurses, yeah. yeah, but not health and safety professionals. That's mm. a good one. Mm-hmm. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that one. Yeah. You, can, you can give us a guess for that one, Louise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, and, you know, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is all about break the bias, isn't it? Um, and I think it's how we you know we all recognize some of those kind of the likability bias and the you know with that feeling like I've got to be 100% I can't make a mistake um and it's kind of those mind worms that that go through your head and 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 I'm no different to anybody else um I think um probably what makes me different is that I just do it anyway so <laughs> So, um, yeah, but I think those are the things that are, are holding back um, women from um, stepping forward, definitely within the profession. Um, so any doors that we can open up to say, you know, you are good enough and you can do this and encouragement, um, making sure that women are visible. So, you know, if we go to conferences, making sure that we've got a gender balance across conferences and and who, the people that are actually out there on platform speaking, um, so people can see a, a wide range of people, and and just like you know, just as you said, they can see themselves. Yeah, and that's um, I always refer back to the the Scully effect from the nineties, where that massive uptick in women who were enrolling in in STEM courses um, associated with the X Files and seeing. Um, you know, that, that role of Dana Scully, that, you know, woman being successful in science and still, you know, not, you know, she was beautiful and um, all of those, all of those other things as well. So it wasn't sort of sacrificing her femininity for a scientific career, um, which I think was, yeah, a interesting outcome from that show that they probably hadn't anticipated. So, yeah, I don't know whether there'll be an uptick from me becoming president, <laughs> who knows? Um, but, you know, I'd like to think um, that, you know, that might be a legacy that um, I take with me is that, um, because I, I think the other thing is, is that, you know, I'm I'm quite a feminine girl as well. And so, you know, it again, it's, you know, that perception of you've got to be, you know tough and autocratic to get on in health and safety actually you know we need everybody we need people you know we need all characteristics um and it's so it's demonstrating that you you can be all of those things yeah so let's talk a bit more about the catch the wave campaign i think something that um 
I want to just draw out there, um, you know, in terms of the types of, um, you know, different range of skill sets maybe that women might be able to bring. You're talking about, you know, um, the role of safety and health professionals in board advocacy. Mm -hmm. Um, Can we maybe explore that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, I think we're being, and this is a post-pandemic thing, isn't it? I think we're being, we've been, the boardroom doors have have been opened up for us. Um, And during the pandemic, we were having to do these, we, we were going into this massively changing environment. And we have a great skill set in terms of being able to react to things quite quickly, turning it around, risk assessing and so on. Um, And I was definitely seeing um, leaders within organisations saying, right, we need to work alongside you. We need to work out how we're going to, you know, do all of this. And there's definitely been a much more collaborative approach um, between health and safety professionals and the C-suite and boardrooms without a shadow of doubt. So Catch the Wave is all about um, how we harness that positivity, what came out of it. Um, I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, you know, the whole pandemic was was a masterclass in, in leadership. Um, and this was an organisation that I, I, I was talking to them sort of every week at, at the height of it. And so they are seeing us now through a different lens. So what we're saying is, you know, catch the wave is all about looking forward and using health and safety to add value to your organizations so when we look at how we develop our organizations through a health and safety lens we're we're already looking at how we can develop our people how we can you know make sure that they are part of the story that they collaborate that they um, we empower them they come up with their own answers so I think good health and safety leadership fits well across industries it's part of why I do health and safety because I love going into companies and seeing how they you know they get better you know as a result of what we can do so catch the wave is very much about looking forward you know solving problems working alongside everybody in a business to 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 move forward but that psychological health and safety is so important um because i think if we don't have that within organizations um we don't have the trust that we need to move forward at this time because it's we're still in tricky times aren't we yeah um just yeah we sort of think that we're at the tail end of it and then something else yeah pops up yeah no definitely so so yeah and there's some really great resources um um, and it's just about how we intertwine health and safety in you know organizations in businesses and create that value um so we're saying to organizations you know come to come to us and, and we will show you how we can um improve and make and work alongside you to improve and make your business better yeah, so I guess, yeah, it's sort of like um, the health and safety function has gone from, you know, sort of standing on the sidelines with a megaphone um, to being invited in and, you know, analogy, please, yeah. please tell us what we need to do. How do we get through this? Um, and so it is, yeah, very much about, you know, how, how as a profession do we actually maintain that um Momentum. Yeah, that momentum and that status and that recognition of the importance of the function that we provide within an organisation or within an industry um, and don't just get elbowed back to the sidelines again. Yeah, I've definitely seen that myself, right? Health and safety are often seen as an obstacle to getting stuff done within businesses, so an obstacle to operations. Um, but during the pandemic, as you pointed out, Louise, um, health and safety was pivotal in keeping businesses operating um, whilst COVID was around. Um, and so it's just changed the perception, I think, of health and safety. And, and then even if the, like the priority of health within health and safety as well, which mm. had always sort of yep. taken more of a backseat previously. Yeah, now we're dealing with virus. Um, it's not the same sort of um, hazards that we're, we're used to dealing with, so health. Um, but also then the su- sustainability angle, right? It's another thing, health and safety, if we can create healthy and thriving organisations with, like you say, psychological health and safety, mm-hmm. 
um, then it's perceived better by investors and, and shareholders, um, which actually builds business value. So if uh, C-suite and, and boards start to really harness the health and safety professionals within their team or in their community, um, health and safety should be seen as, you know, being things that build up business success and build up business value uh, rather than being a hindrance to operations, which I think historically is, has been the view. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that analogy of standing on the edge with a megaphone saying, <laughs> and, and I think that has, I think there's a transition for the profession to go through. Um, we've got um, one of the areas that kind of coincides with it, within this in IR, she's our competency framework. Um, and I think that whole megaphone analogy is all around, well, I know all this technical stuff that um, I'm going to impart on you and tell you how to do your job. <laughs> and it's it's kind of moving away from that technical, which is really important. We've got to know the technical stuff, but actually it's our approach and, and how our approach changes so that we're actually using coaching. Um, we're being more creative in our solutions. Um, we're being more collaborative. Um, so we're taking people with us. And I think that, um, you know, I'm 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 doing this at the moment in council as well, and it's really interesting to watch the different dynamics. Is actually empowering people and saying, right, here's here's your frame, here's your project, here's a blank piece of paper, come back with something. Um, and I think health and safety is moving in that direction where it is much more about our soft skills. I don't like to call them soft skills; they're power skills. Um, and how we um, enable others to take care of themselves and take care of the person who's working alongside them. Yeah, it's um, fantastic. And unfortunately, it took a pandemic, right, for things like the role of the importance of the health and safety professional and the importance of things like psychological health and safety to come more to the, the forefront. Um, but I guess a lot of health and safety professionals had never really thought much about pandemics or how to deal with the health implications associated with that and had to become experts pretty much overnight, just like school teachers had to learn how to use Zoom overnight and run remote classrooms. Um, but how can health and safety professionals then stay ahead of the game um, and be able to react to new and existing demands? Well, yeah, um, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I think it's it's sticking close to the business. We've got a um, great competency framework within IOSH. Um, we've got a really strong future leaders network within IOSH who um, are, are looking at this and definitely looking at the future of the profession. Um, and something that I've done in IOSH as well is created a um, subgroup within council that is looking at the future of the profession and how we adapt. Um, and I think we've got to move we as health and safety professionals, we don't create the trends that are coming. Those, all of those things come from business. So business, you know, needed us at the time of the pandemic to keep the wheels of industry moving. And I think that as business is changing and, and, and the way that we do business definitely is changing. That's why social sustainability is being talked about much more than it was you know, these big organisations have, have realised they've got to put their hand in their pocket and create an infrastructure that protects their staff and protects their communities. Um, so, so business is adapting and adjusting to a new climate where social sustainability is, is important. And it's it's about us as health and safety professionals being much more agile and flexible and actually being part of that movement and part of that change. So our future leaders community um, are, are, are definitely up there and, and supporting us with that. But I'm a huge fan of diversity of thought. So, so we've got the future professionals coming through. We've got people that are new to the sector, but we've also got people that have been around for a while, um, of which I count myself as one of those. So, you know, we're not, we're not recreating the issues that we created 10, 20 years ago. 
um, and we're continuing to move forward. So I think it's about us creating a much more agile um, and forward looking profession. Yeah. And that professional networking is just so valuable. Um, I'm trying to, you know, show to people that, you know, if you look at things that are evidence based where you have to go through a peer review publication, or even if you're publishing a book, right. By the time you come up with these thoughts based on maybe it's very current when you're thinking about how you're going to write the book and you're, you're sketching it out then you actually have to write the thing then you have to go through an editorial process, then it gets published. By the time that things come comes out, your thoughts are already probably a year old, if not longer, if you're going through a peer review journal, um, you know, if you want to stay up to date with the most up to date information, it's through liaising with your peers, finding out what are they dealing with and how are they innovating and dealing with it. Um, yes, it is good to be granted in theory and, and best practice and, and evidence, but if you want to be innovative and you know be up to date, then you can't beat professional development. That's what's so great about these podcasts. We get to meet yeah. some of the best minds in the world in the psych health and safety space who are telling us what they're working on now, not what they published five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that whole networking piece is just exploded. I mean, I, um, you know, have colleagues that I'm working on really closely um, on different aspects all over the world and and i'll just get i'll be coming off the train from london or something and i'll get a telephone call from canada and it's it's you know we've opened up those doors like never before and um that cross communication that we now have in the health and safety arena is just phenomenal and because let's face it we're all dealing with the same stuff aren't we um and we all have the same um desire and the same goal to make sure that people can go home safely at the end of the day um so actually working in the way that we are and and i'm a great fan of podcasts as well um podcasts short articles those kind of things are definitely keeping us at the forefront without a shadow of a doubt and it is you're right it's just all happening so fast and so quickly so um, you've mentioned a couple of um, the, the strategies that IOSH have um, started to sort of ensure that the profession is fit to continue, you know, meeting the demands of business moving forward. Are there any other um, strategies or um, initiatives that IOSH are doing in that space? So, so our big one at the moment is catch the wave. Um, but during, depending on when you have me back, I don't know, <laughs> have me back at the end of the at the end of my year. But um, we've we're working kind of beyond work twenty twenty two now, which is was our strategy that we released five years ago. So we've got lots of work going on in the background to develop the next strategy for IOSH. Um, and I think it's going to be an evolution rather than a revolution 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 yeah get my words right um but that's going to be inspiring and inspirational I think it's going to be it is going to bring the modern health and safety professional right to the forefront um but I, I will caveat that always by saying you know in this in this business we need all types of people um and and I recognize that kind of you know that coaching style that empowerment style it is an it is a transition for some people um but we need everybody in our profession I think that diversity of thought that we if we can bring that and harness that um we 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 certainly can save more lives and and we need that global collective at the moment um for people to feel that they can actually meet some of the challenges in the world that we're facing because let you know and and they are you know many and great at the moment yeah no yeah you're absolutely right that we um yeah i think well we're, we're looking ahead to you know people who are really good at collaborating and coaching and and that sort of thing but um let's not forget the importance of people who are really technically competent and yeah. who are subject matter experts. Um, you know, we do need that whole that whole spectrum of of mm -hmm. skill and um, and knowledge and all of that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, while it's exciting to see a profession moving in um, in a direction um, the way that we are at the moment, um, yeah, we need to remember that we need yeah, everybody. That's right. We we shouldn't be. Um, 
throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, and again, some of the work that I'm doing in camps is just fascinating for this because I have this massive diverse group of people all working together um, on different projects. And actually, if we can harness all of those differences and put them into this big melting pot and come through the other side, that's how we can massively make a difference, I think. And it, you know, because let's face it, you know, certainly in, if I look at the UK statistics in respect of, you know, physical health and safety, we've reached a plateau. So we've got to do something different. We can't, we, we do need to reinvent ourselves. Um, but yeah, as you say, don't throw the baby out with bath water. Yeah, interesting, Louise, that the pandemic obviously uh, was a massive call to arms for the health and safety profession to deal with this health crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a new one coming, um, and Peter Kelly would often call it, you know, the, uh, the, the and other people, the, uh, the second, second wave. Um, uh, and really, if you look at even today's statistics, right, from the Labor Force survey, um, half of non-fatal illnesses and injuries in the UK are still due to work-related stress, depression, and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a burning enough platform um, for another call to arms and for the health and safety profession to use their skill set to prevent psychological injury? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know that this for me is an absolute core foundation. I think, you know, it, it was something that we were talking about before. It's been brought right to the forefront as a result of, of the pandemic. And, but I think what has been holding us back is organisations find it difficult to deal with because we are talking about people, we're talking about their feelings. Um, and, you know, when we have those anxieties and those stresses within our organisations, um, organisations find that really hard to deal with. They find it a difficult topic to get to grips with. Um, particularly if you've got, you know, people in the C-suite who've got there by being quite autocratic, you know, and they've got there by using leadership styles that are not conducive to preventing stress and anxiety within an organisation. And so for them, there's some real soul searching to do. And you've got to look at your organisation and be really honest with yourself. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do you've got to kind of open yourself up and be vulnerable um and i think that's why organizations find it so difficult to actually get a grip with this um but i think if health and safety professionals are working alongside our hr colleagues um again it comes back to that risk based skill set that we have we we can look at this and we can create psychologically um healthy and safe organizations for us all to work in yeah it's um it might come down to i guess what's incentivizing the uh, c-suite um you know what what are the board kind of metrics that are put down there was another um uh mining example recently where the ceo came out uh turns out that he didn't have the great greatest of leadership styles and uh, really failed on the people uh area of how he his his performance was assessed um but the people component of how he was assessed was only 5% of his, of yeah. the total assessment. And so he's flagged that that's probably going to become larger as this social sustainability um, uh, and how companies really, you know, are, are demonstrating what they're doing to shareholders um, and, and demonstrating that sustainability becomes more and more important. So maybe it's a matter of, you know, the C-suite, particularly the CEO, uh, the metrics that border uh, the board is putting around how they're measuring their performance to swing more on the people arm, and then you know health and safety to get more more resources and ask to, you know, um, show, use their wares around risk management skills uh, to deal with this psychological health and safety crisis. Yeah, I think um, what I see is that the C suite have to want to do it. If mm. they don't want to do it, we end up with resilience training and you know um gym memberships don't we that's right it's it's more yeah. like let's just do a warm and fuzzy thing yeah. to demonstrate that but that's really not getting to the point so yeah, yeah. i think it does come down to uh, how is the ceo compensated or um how are they performance appraised 
and making sure that the metrics line up. If the company truly is, in, and this is actually at a board level, right? If the company truly is, um, it does care about social sustainability and about the welfare of their people, then they need to make sure that that's all in kilter with with how the company is 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 assessed, and and that goes to the CEO. Yeah, because I, you know because all that happens if they don't really focus on it they'll get they'll you know it'll be the next marketing campaign or the next finance plan that that takes over any discussions and it is about creating that balance that is you know that sustainable balance within a business one of the things that I talk about do you remember cat's cradle when you're a kid so you pull on one thread and it pulls in another direction somewhere else and and we need to create that balance. So by putting our people first and actually caring about how they feel and making sure that they've got safe and healthy work environments, they're going to solve these other problems that we've got. So, so if we can start from that as basis, I think that's massively powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, we, we did ask you last time you were on, Louise, and because we asked all of our guests the same question, you know, what are your hopes for the future of workplace mental health? Um, I haven't gone and done my homework and listened to how you responded to that question last time. Um, but maybe we reshape it and think about, well, you know, you've got less than a year left on your presidency. Um, so what are your hopes for, I guess, the future of your presidency, particularly as it pertains to workplace mental health? Well, um, yeah, so going back to my main theme, which is people's sustainability and putting heart into health and safety, um, I, I guess my main focus is for people to see that heart and that feeling as um, powerful and forward looking rather than something that's to be backed off from. Um, so, so for me, that's, that's my hope. So by the end of the year, um, I definitely hope that that kind of feeling that goes into what we do, that instinct, um, caring about how people feel and empowering everybody to be the best that they can. Um, that's what I hope will mark the end of my presidency. Definitely. And it probably is different to what I said last time, because um, you know, things are evol evolving so fast and I'm definitely, um, sort of moving forward on so many different things but that psychological health and safety is, is actually becoming a bigger and bigger part of the stuff that I'm talking about at the moment you'll be pleased to know <laughs> that is that is great <laughs> so um, Louise the other question that we asked you last time we're going to ask you again um, words of advice for listeners who want to work in the field of psychological health and safety um, yeah, I mean, I would say network, um, be connected, um, listen to great podcasts like this, <laughs> um, and just take that step of faith, I guess, is just, you know, I think we need to just move forward and not be afraid, um, or be afraid and do it anyway, I <laughs> guess. So yeah, just, just keep moving forward, be connected to these networks that we have a phenomenal um, so let's just keep hold of that, even as we start to open up again. Yeah, the the power of networks is um, yeah, it's yeah, it's really amazing when you um when you actually experience it a little bit. Absolutely. Well, Louise, it's been amazing having you on this time as president of, of IOSH. Um, I don't know if we'll get a chance to have you on again as president of IOSH, but it's been great having you on and um, sharing a bit about the themes of your pregnancy and the Catch the Wave of the campaign and uh, very pertinent on International Women's Day to have a, a, a woman who is in a really um, important leadership position for a worldwide network of health and safety professionals. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's always great to be back here. I will get you on it, but maybe not in your presidency. It will be yeah, when, you're, uh, when I come yeah. out the other side. <laughs> yeah, right. And then we'll be able to ask about, you know, what, what would you have done differently? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, well, uh, that brings us to the end of the show, listeners. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, remember, we do video these things while we're recording with our guests. And so you'll be able to catch that video on the Flourish DX YouTube page if you have interest. Uh, we'll also take some of these clips and put them on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page um, if you want to see some of the best clips from today's session and, and other podcast episodes that we've had as well. 
uh, while you're over on LinkedIn, uh, make sure you connect with Joelle and myself. Uh, definitely follow the IOSH page uh, that's there. Um, and there's lots of um, uh, professional um, uh, pages associated with the IOSH uh, brand as well. And uh, Louise probably wouldn't even mind if you are connected with her either or gave her a follow. So uh, that brings us to the end, listeners. We'll catch you next episode.